So he has kindly agreed to uh, give us a short talk today about uh, PharmaLine. I met him during the data collection for my own uh, research in, in Ghana this last November. Uh, we met in Accra, but he's actually from, Kum uh, from Kumasi, where together with a few other energetic people that I didn't end up meeting, actually. Yeah, so it is one of them. Sandra was one of them. Face, face um, he started uh, the local tech community there um, around an um, initiative called M Friday, so it's like mobile Mondays, but on, on Fridays. Um, and it's attached to the Science and te te Technology University there, yeah, I yeah. think, yeah, attached yeah. to the university. Yeah, yeah, and so I wanted, or we wanted to have uh, Aloysius talk today because he's sort of this grassroots entrepreneurial success story that uh, donor and development organizations dream of. That's sort of often not a reality, but that's sort of, you know, what donor organizations aspire to, to, to see. And so, uh, you know, I thought it would be interesting for you all to, to, to hear. It's been three years now with FarmerLine? Uh, yeah, three years, uh, funded in three years, launched uh, for the past two years. Right, and he's sort of really gone through the almost stereotypical steps of, you know, winning a little competition, then getting some seed funding, uh, and then, you know, getting access to these bigger networks like Equine Green. Maybe you're going you're, you're gonna to talk uh, about that as well. So it's sort of this picture perfect, uh, at least sort of first year success story of a, of a social tech entrepreneur. And that's what I wanted to, uh, why I wanted um, Aloysius to talk. Shandorf, I think, is value chain, yeah. responsible for the, for the value chain. So there might be questions about that uh, from, from that corner, from that as well. So it's great that you're, you're here as well. Um, and yeah, I'm not going to say too much more about, uh, uh, about PharmaLine, because I guess that's what the talk is about. Um, I think, you know, as I said, everyone knows the ICT for the seminar series. So what's going on next week is also clear back to labor um, and labor conditions is also going to be uh, very interesting. Um, but I guess with that, I can just hand it over to Aloysius. So we have uh, about 45 minutes. It's up to you if you want to use all that. If you want, if we want to have more conversation, mm -hmm. uh, it's up to you. I, get, I give the floor to you with that. All right. Thanks so much, everyone, for making time uh, to meet us on, uh, on such a short notice. Um, I'm still in the pitch mode. I spent the past... Uh, six days trying to pitch to win the Unilever Prize, which we didn't win. So then, if I'm pitching too much, just raise up your hand and ask me questions anytime. Uh, I'm basically going to use the same slide I used, uh, made a few edits. So it's basically going to be sharing our story. If something is not clear, please ask me questions anytime. Um, so I'll just talk briefly about what we do, what we do at Farmala and then our story to this point. Um, so basically what we are doing, we started out by trying to um, provide information. Uh, the company I work for is PharmaLine. We are trying to bridge the information gap that is existing between small-scale farmers in rural Ghana and also the research institutions and then the government agriculture extension agents. The government agriculture extension agents are people that are usually tasked to go to these villages to deliver information to farmers. But unfortunately, they are unable to do that on a very, very um, consistent basis. Farmers need access to information like the weather. They need to be able to get timely and accurate information now help them to increase their yield and make more money. So that's our business, specializing in delivering information to small-scale farmers who use uh, cheap phones like this. Um, I'm sure you've seen it before, but if you've not seen it before, I can pass it around for you to touch it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we also have a smart app for um, food companies, uh, big businesses that source their raw materials from, from Ghana, from Africa, to be able to manage their supply chain. So then that app is also here. I can send it around for people to play with if they want to. Um, and maybe in the phone too, if you want to. Um, so, my, my story. Um, I, when I was five, my parents broke up. Um, so then I was sent to go and stay with my aunt in Volta region, Ho, which is uh, a region that shares border with uh, Togo. Um, we speak ever. Um, so when I was five, my aunt was a small-scale farmer. So then she takes my sister and I to the farm every time. She sells rice during the day, uh, during the weekdays from Monday to Friday. And then we go to the farm on Saturday, at times on Sunday, if we have a lot of work to do. I was not a very good farmer by then. I hated it. Uh, I wanted to stay back home and play soccer with my friends, but I couldn't. So then what I typically do those days is to go to the farm with her, but I basically sleep while my sister and my aunt and other relatives work so hard. Um, in college, I was going to read uh, biological science. I didn't get a chance to read that because I didn't like the school. And I realized that that's the only school that's going to pick me eventually because I didn't get really, really good grades. So when I got there, biological science was full, so I had to do agriculture. 
So then in my life, I found myself doing agriculture or, or being with agri against my will, uh, you know, me not wanting to do it. In college, I chose uh, renewable natural resources. Um, I, I chose natural resources, actually. That's the name of the course. Thinking that it's, it's about petroleum and gas, because we just wanted, uh, like, you know, petrol in Ghana. So then, uh, you know, everybody wants to make money. But when we got there with Shandoff, uh, uh, it was our first uh, class rep when we were in first year. During our orientation, they were talking about the courses that we do in our faculty, and then they were talking about uh, wildlife, fisheries. It's all about renewable natural resources, nothing, uh, nothing about oil, oil and gas. So then I was really, really disappointed because I knew that the only job that was existing was to go back to the government and work for the extension of resources, the forestry, garden trees in the forest, which I didn't want to do. So then I was asking, I was, uh, you know, thinking about what else can I do during my days in university to acquire skills that will make me more marketable. It was all about making money, surviving at that point, uh, due to my background. And while I was finding myself with agriculture, with my aunt and everything, I've, I've seen one consistent theme going through, lack of training and also access to information. That has affected her greatly and the rest of my family and also the community that I grew up in. They are not able to know about the weather. When I was much younger, they can look at the cloud and know when it to rain, so they can predict weather by the cloud. But due to climate change, they can't do that anymore. So lack of uh, access to um, weather forecast, knowing when it to rain, has made my aunt and her community lose a lot of money uh, that they've invested into buying seeds and fertilizer. So then on days like, uh, on bad days, they go out um, to buy this fertilizer and seeds. They apply and then it rains. So the rain washes everything away. And that's about 80% of their costs in the entire season going down the drain through rain because they didn't know about fertilizer. When they manage to go through all those struggles to grow whatever they are growing, be yam, raise, uh, yam, maize, rice, serving, the middlemen or the market women in the big markets in Accra still drive down to our villages and then they, they buy it at a very, very cheap price. One, because there's a lot of that same variety of crops in the village and then and two, because they don't know the market prices. Um, so that's affecting them. And also financial tips, they don't know how to keep records. So then the banks and the microfinance institutions are not willing to give them money. So um, this story like stayed with me. So then in college, it was all about survival, trying to survive. So then my first company, Alloy World, was about trying to like do video photography and all that and make money to support myself in school because it's very, very rare for people from my community to actually make it to college. And if you make it to college, your parents are like, you know, we force for you, so you have to like, you know, the rest is on you. So then um, we were, you know, we were seeing the success story that was coming out from East Africa. We heard about M-Pesa, Ushahidi. Uh, and not liking my course made me to learn stuff about the web, how to build for the web. So then I was watching videos online. They are really, really common web development sites that are there that you can be able to learn and teach yourself anything that you want to do in web development. So then I was building websites for people as part of my first company. But one thing that was missing was that I didn't know how to build for the, for the mobile phone. So then Tim Lee's uh, um, foundation, the World Wide Web Foundation, they were doing a program called the Mobile Web Ghana, where they were training young people on how to uh, uh, build applications using SMS and voice. And then I, I remember by then I was writing my final year thesis, and then I left school for about three weeks to attend that training. And then part of the training is that uh, you must use the skills that you've just acquired to um, solve a social issue. So the, the, the only thing that, that stood out to me by then was uh, trying to build something that supports skill farm, uh, um, small scale farmers like my aunt, because the situation has worsened. When I was when I was younger, one extension officer has to work with about thousand farmers. But about ten years later, ten years later, they have to work with about two thousand farmers, and then they don't even get to talk to these two thousand farmers very often. And and even if they do, they don't. They are not able to give them the information in a um, timely manner. So this is greatly affecting their their yield and income. And then. During that research, trying to build something for small-scale farmers or trying to build something purposely to win that competition uh, right at the, at the training, we were doing a lot of research. So then we came across the fact that it's not only my aunt or my family or even Ghanaian farmers that are facing this challenge, but farmers globally or farmers in Africa are facing that same challenge. Small-scale farmers globally, as you may know, are feeding one-third of humanity right now. And even in Africa, seven out of ten people are small-scale are involved in agriculture. And their yield is usually low because they are not able to have access to all the information and all these problems that I've stated that my, that my aunt was facing. So that we saw an opportunity to build something that not only my community will use, but a lot of people across Africa will be using. 
So then I remembered my co-founder and I, who's not here today, Emmanuel, we, we sat down, we used, we were, we were so obsessed about this new technology that we just learned, we built the first prototype, SMS. And then I remember making the first trip to the farmers, the extension officers, and showing this to them and say, hey, this challenge that you're facing right now, we have something that can fix all this problem. It was really hard. They gave us all the, uh, the harsh criticisms, but we took something valuable that was very useful and is very useful to us today. They told us that small scale farmers don't use smartphones. They can't read and write. So if you are giving them information about the weather, if you are giving them all this information, hoping that it will help them, help them on their farm, they can't use it because they can't read and write. Plus, SMS is very expensive as compared to other <coughs> forms of uh, communication voice. So in-person communications or maybe phone calls. Because if you want to teach somebody how to apply fertilizer, you have to send about 12 or 10 messages to do that. As compared to saying that in about 30 seconds, which costs you less. So it's actually more expensive to do that. So that was like the turning point for us. You put SMS aside, despite all the inspiration that we've taken from what SMS has done in East Africa and elsewhere in the world. So then we spent about a year trying to build our first application, which is voice. So basically what we have right now and what we've been using for the past year and a half is sending information to farmers in any local language at all. Taking this, that same experience that they once had with the agriculture extension officers and taking it through technology and sending it to them. So all of a sudden, that one extension officer that works with about 2,000 farmers can reach all those farmers that he works with by the press of a button. And above all, he can do that with his voice, which still maintains the trust and also the ability of the farmers to adopt the message because they know that his, this information is coming from this officer that they know and trust and have worked with for the past 10, 15 years. So that's what we did. And we are also able to send weather forecasts to farmers in their local languages. All these information that they didn't have access to before, they can now have access to it through our technology um, before, before I go there. And one big thing that we also realized that it didn't actually work was that um, we thought that once we've launched this application and then we do a lot of marketing, farmers will actually start paying for it. So then we got some grants from, uh, we won some award first through the US Department of State, Apps for Africa, about $3,000. No, our first award was $600 through the World Wide Web Foundation and then $3,000 through Apps for Africa to actually run the pilot. And then it didn't work after spending so much money trying to get the farmers to sign up onto the system. They didn't pay for it because they, they were used to getting it for free from the extension officers. Even though we've added technology to it, make it really cool and sending it to them, they are not able to pay. Even some who are willing to pay are not able to pay because we don't have the payment platform that is existing in East Africa, like M-Pesa, wherever they can pay. We have the mobile money from the various mobile uh, phone operators, but they are basically in Accra, Kumasi, which are like the two big cities. But when you go to rural areas in, in Ghana, they don't have a very big distribution that they can be able to pay onto. So then what these guys do, Shandoff, which is our value chain director, is that before we sign up a farmer, we're able to sign up about 600 farmers every, every week. They go to the villages, do a workshop through the government extension officers, and then they get these farmers to <laughs> sign up. The farmers are happy to receive the information. They are happy to apply it, but most of them are willing to pay. And then some of them who are even willing to pay are not worth it for us to actually go after them to take the money because you can take, you can spend about maybe $2 traveling to them to go and take $1, which is basically not worth it. So for our work with the farmers is basically funded by us or funded by some aid agency or maybe some donor. So we, there's an organization here in the UK called, uh, in, in London called Indigo Trust. They gave us the first money, big money, which was about 5,200 pounds. It was really, really big for us. We just finished college. We've done money. We, we run the pilot. We've, we've shown an increase in their yield with, with uh, over 50%. But the biggest challenge was farmers not willing to pay. So then we have to be able to find a way and to innovate, uh, innovate around that problem. To actually get farmers to pay. So looking down the supply value chain, you realize that there are other players down the line. There are NGOs, there are food companies like Hershey, Amajaro, that sources about 100,000 cocoa. That sources cocoa from about 100,000 cocoa farmers in Ghana, working in so many countries across Africa. They have an interest in making sure that the farmers that they are sourcing from actually produce the required quantity and then the quantity that they need. They are willing to pay m money doing it. And above all, they want to learn as much as possible from these farmers. They want to learn about their yield. They want to learn about the kind of fertilizers that they are applying to their farms. They want to learn about how they are growing. They want to learn about how they sell. So then all these things are there. And then they are spending a lot of money doing that. 
when you see a typical aid, uh, in, uh, aid organization in Ghana working with farmers, they have a lot of motorbikes and a lot of cars. About 70% of their cost goes into like uh, you know administration trying to get down to these rural areas. So then this technology is now trying to help them to cut down that cost, their communication cost, their data collection cost, their traceability cost. So then they don't have to like hire as, uh, so many people going down to these villages with pens and paper, coming back to the offices with data, trying to enter this data into Excel, and then trying to make money out of it to write their reports for their donors or for their clients or for their, for their food companies. So that's where we see the opportunity. Our first, our first big customer that paid us, that wrote us a big check, was uh, a USAID funded company uh, uh, project. It was happening through my university. I was volunteering for, for them. They were training uh, fish farmers every single year, the best farm management practices. And they bring all the fish farmers in Ghana every year down to a centralized location. They pay them sitting allowances, transportation costs. That's something very common. Farmers know that. They play that so well. They can take sitting allowance from each uh, donor-funded project. And they are so good at taking that. So maybe their business usually in the season is, let's find out all the projects in my area and let me register for each of them. I'll get souvenirs, I'll get sitting allowance. So that was the exact thing happening in my college. So they bring them down, they do like really, really cool PowerPoints, big books with research. They share it to them, they do PowerPoint presentations. Most of the farmers are either too tired or they don't really understand the thing, but they will just keep nodding their head. I'm sure you got this in Ghana. Everybody says yes to whatever you're saying, them. It's the saying to them. With the hope that something good is going to come out of the end. Maybe if you are a foreigner, maybe they'll get a green card, or maybe they'll get some cool money, or maybe some souvenir somewhere. So then most of those things were happening. And then they have to be teaching the same content to, to these farmers for three years. They come every time, they teach them the same thing, and then they, they keep forgetting. Um, volunteering at that place, I was asking the farmers, like, do you actually remember what you learned the past year? Most of them were really, really honest. Most of them were saying that this is a good time for them to catch up with their friends, to learn from their friends, to see what their friends are actually doing. So then they don't usually follow the information that is being given to them. And even the format that this information was given to them was really, really difficult. So then when we built this and we showed it to the, to the team, they were really, really open to it. So then they wrote a big check for us, uh, about $25,000, to send reminders of what they are teaching the farmers through the workshops throughout the year. and. Um, um, giving them this information in a format that they can easily understand and when they need it. So do, do, those, that was our first big bet. The second big, big bet was another USAID project in the north uh, called Advance. They raised about $100 million, so they were really happy to give us about $3,000 to just pilot this with a group of their farmers. So then these things actually gave us the, the, you know, the credibility and also the platform to have some early results to be able to uh, apply for further competitions, uh, to apply for conferences, to share our impact stories. So to date, um, directly we've worked with 5,000 farmers so far, directly ourselves with our content. Uh, part of them was through we actually going to recruit the farmers, and our 4,000 of them are women, and then we recruited her through an, a, a project funded by the Canadian uh, CEDA uh, through an organization called MIDA. So then these women, these women actually received information throughout the season on how to grow soybean. They got information on, on weather forecast in their local languages. And this we have seen that it has increased their income by over 50%. It's actually 55.6%, but uh, yeah, our coaches during reading that we said you should, you should say over 50%, so I put that there. Um, so that was, that was something that was really, really remarkable. Let me state a, a typical example. A lot of uh, people in Ghana take fish, and we import about $400 million worth of fish every year. Every meal in Ghana has fish. I'm sure if you've been to Ghana, you can see that. Our soups, our stews have fish in it. The average person takes fish for like three or four times, three or four days in a week. So then there's a very big demand for fish. So so many people are going into the industry doing aquaculture. But the biggest cost in aquaculture is knowing what to do at the right time, and also buying feed. And all the feed that comes in are usually imported. So all these people who are trying to uh, venture into this sector import all this feed and then they pour a lot of feed into the water hoping that when the fish grows it become big and then they can be able to sell because they sell by the weight. The bigger your fish, the more money that you make. Because So if you have about 1,000 fishes in the pond and each fish, each fish is, way, is way more than one kilo, then you can, be, you can be able to make more money. But if they are below one kilo, it will mean that you have to take about four or five pieces for one kilo to sell. So then all of them after... Uh, all of them are after getting like a very big fish. 
But what they've seen over the years is that because you're pouring a lot of feed into the water, the water was becoming uh, nutritious, I'll say. So then plants were growing into the water. These plants compete with the fish for oxygen. So they are not only losing money through feed, they are also seeing like low yield because the fishes were dying. So, so just giving them this simple information about the quantity of fish to pour into the pond has actually helped them to increase their income and yield. Because the market is already there waiting to, to get fish. So once you produce, there are people who will buy from you. So just knowing, just, just uh, producing the right quality and quantity will get you the money that you need. And that's what we've done that has helped these fish farmers. The second one was the food companies and the NGOs. So last year or this year, we're working with Hershey right now to be able to ma uh, map and manage their supply chain. They have 100,000 cocoa farmers for them, with them that they buy their cocoa from. Then they sell it to chocolate companies like Unilever, uh, uh, um, Hershey, and, and all these guys. So then they are also paying us right now um, to use our apps, like the one I've passed around right now on the tablet or on uh, any Android device uh, to communicate, uh, to trace, and also to map uh, the farmers that they are working with. They are paying for this because it's cheap. Uh, it helps them to collect accurate information. And also it's easy for them and fast for them to generate their reports, which is one big thing for them to be able to make their money back, either from a donor or somebody who is buying from them. Um, <coughs> so before they came, uh, before we came in, they were using GIS handheld devices to be able to map the farms. The difficulty is uh, um, linking mapped fields to individual farmers. So then if I'm from my A, I have like four fields, and then you come to my farm to map, when you get back to the office, it's very, very difficult for them to actually link the fields that you have mapped to me. So then if you're unable to link the fields that you have mapped to me, then it means that all the data that you have collected will become redundant because you can't connect them to me. And it's very, very difficult for them to do that. So then with this, they are able to generate unique IDs for each farmer. And then anytime they map the farm, they're able to link all the farm, the yield data, every information to one, a farmer so then they're able to learn as much as they can from them it is fast it is quick it's easy and it's also cheap so they are willing to pay for it just last week uh they have projects going on in um sierra leone and also cameroon so then just riding on their shoulders and also their um, networks in country we are deploying this software in that country for them to use um so that's some of the the stories uh with working with uh, the big clients and doing this, uh, we started out, uh, I started out with my co-founder, Imano. Uh, he's much older, not too old, about 30 years. And then we got turned off, my friend, for six years uh, to join the team, our student president. So after, after college in 2012, we, we, we got him. And all these guys have been working with us for about two years now. Um, we, they are between the ages of 25 to 30. Uh, two of us are um, Equine Green Fellows. And most of them, this is the first job that they've ever taken in their lives. And then we started out by paying everyone about hundred dollars to one fifty dollars, two hundred dollars, and now uh, two fifty dollars. And just in January, we've increased it to uh, five hundred dollars. Um, so basically, um, we are very excited. We are very excited about what is happening right now. Uh, the fact that we've been able to take an idea and bring it to this stage despite all the challenges, which I'm happy to talk about. If you ask me any questions related to any specific challenge, I'm able to share. We failed so many times. Um, um, and also, these guys believe that we have the chance to create something really big that will contribute to a big problem that is existing, uh, helping farmers to produce more food to feed the future. And they are really, really inspired about it, and they are willing to work so hard about it. So there are so many people right now in Ghana who think or dream about working with us, strangely. Uh, these eight organizations have given us a lot of press uh, for their own reasons and also for reasons that will be very, very beneficial to us right now. Um, so basically, that's our story. Um, let me see if there are more slides. No, there are no more slides. Um, so if you have any questions, I'm sure there are a lot of questions. Feedbacks, please ask me. Thank you. I have like 10, but I will open the floor to, to, to you guys first. Thank you for your talks, very interesting. Um, I'm just curious to know, I mean, you've given us an overview of uh, some of the challenges that you had, but what would you say are some of the biggest lessons 
that you've learnt through this process in terms of if you were to give advice to other people that were kind of wanting to follow in your path, what would be some of the things that you would say, do not do that, or some of the really key challenges that you've had to overcome? Um, the first one is uh, be open to criticisms. Um, uh, it was really difficult for, I spent a lot of time defending this idea, giving over 100 pitches and about 50 of them in the early stages were like fighting with experienced people in the industry, telling them why my idea is genius and why their feedback was not working. But in a very, very difficult way, I, I found out that I should have listened. Um, so that's one. Uh, number two is find uh, people that are really, really smarter than you and give them the room to operate. Um, because people who are smarter than you will work with you for one thing. If you're not paying them well, then they'll work with you because they have the room to be able to create their own ideas under your umbrella and run with it. So you should be able to do that. Get smart people, smart local people who are equally passionate and uh, try to share the vision with them and give them room to operate. Yeah. What's, what's your... What's your vision for like five years time? Uh, five years time. Um, you want or to even one year time, whatever you feel. But like, where yeah, do you yeah, see yeah. yourself, and your company going? Uh, we want to. Um, one big thing that we want to do, achieve in Ghana for the first time is to get from a staff in for the service. Uh, so in March we will get a license from NCA, the National Communication Authority, with a short code. So people can be able to subscribe directly, so that we can be able to prove that either if they want to actually pay or not. Sorry. So then they can be able to subscribe for our services directly and then they can pay from their airtime. That's one big thing that we want to test so that we can safely say that, hey, we give these people the platform, the payment platform, and they just don't want to pay and we find out why. But now we can't say for sure why they are not paying, so we want to do that. And two, we want to uh, license this technology or give it out to as many people as possible working towards food security. So people in Malawi, anybody working in Africa, Asia, who are supporting small scale farmers, be it food companies like Unilever that have a crazy goal of helping and supporting about 500,000 small scale farmers globally. We want to give this out to them to use. So we'll be focusing on building the technology and also licensing it out to as many people who are currently using SMS or using any form of communication to adopt it to use for their farmers. Yeah. So just a following question. So you, you're interested in the smallholders paying, were you interested in is it more interesting that smallholders farmers pay or that Unilever pays for all of the kind of supply chain? And is there, a, is there a reason why you're thinking that way? Is it about sustainability for the long term? You know, could you just explain a little bit more about your kind of revenue model and like why you're thinking that way? All right, so we want farmers to pay for it because we want them to have autonomy. We want them to have control about what they want to grow in a season. And then we also want the food companies to pay if they've already found their own farmers who have agreed to produce whatever crop that they want to buy from them. So then the farmers have agreed on them on, on their own. But if a farmer wants to be able to produce maybe yam this season, they have to be able to produce yam because that's what they want to do or that's what they want to use to feed their family. They don't have to do it because a big food company or an NGO is paying for it. Yeah. So we want to be able to make those two options available. Yeah. Right now, about 90% of our revenue is coming from the food companies. And that's where most of our competitors or people in the space are asked right now. They are like enjoying um, uh, the grant applications, the food companies, and going after them because it's easy. Uh, but the hard part, which nobody has done so far, as far as I'm concerned, is um, getting small scale farmers to actually pay for their services as compared to giving it to them for free. Yeah. Thank you. And just follow up question what you, what you just said, sorry. You said you know they're going for the grants with the with the food company. So often there's sort of a, a sort of combined funding where an aid organization gives some grant and the company uh, tops that up. Or how, you know, a, a company paying for that data is different from from grants being given. But there's sort of mixed funding models there that uh, that the tech entrepreneurs uh, try to access. Well, what what I know is happening right now is. Uh so maybe EU decides that they are committing about 30 million euros to food security. So there are people who have like really, really skilled business development experts that find these opportunities. So then immediately they form uh, you know, consortiums. They get somebody from the Ministry of Food and Agriculture to say, there's a government representation involved because donors want to see that, that in local people are involved. So they, get, they form a consortium, apply for that grant, which lasts for usually three to five years, and then they win it. Um, I was reading something on the Unilever website right now, and I realized that the Unilever actually worked worked with uh, GIZ to deliver some services to farmers in, uh, I think, Swaziland or somewhere. That's a, that is the first time I actually saw 
a big food company actually working with uh, uh, like um, uh, an aid organization to help farmers. But I've not seen that like you know uh, them in Ghana yet. What I've seen a lot of time is most companies work with either a local organization or maybe a government organization, and then they apply for for funding from either the EU or GIZ or DFID or um, USAID. Yeah. I see. Okay. Thanks. Sorry, Chris. Um, yeah, I just had a couple of questions. One was, um, I mean, this kind of uh, kind of farmer mobile application space. There's quite a few other firms, you know, like in Ghana. I think there's like Isoko. Is yeah, Isoko. Yeah. And other firms like this, Nokia. Um, how do you interact with them? Do you are they competition, or is there ways of integrating with them? Um, the other thing I also wanted to ask was that you know, like farming is quite a diverse field. I mean, there's export commodities which go through very complex value chains to retailers yeah, yeah. and you know like one you know farmers producing stuff which they just sell to the local market is there any specific kind of part of you know different value chains which when there's specific ones you're focusing on or do you take a more kind of general approach so those are my two questions uh, well <laughs> the the competition like there are other people who are doing this and it's basically competition like people competing against each other we've had so many conversations on our, competi our competitions when we started some of them have uh, shot us in the foot which i can't talk about right now because there's camera there um <laughs> uh, yeah yeah but some of them come hey you're young i like what you're doing let's collaborate you send them your decks you send them your stuff away technology the next day you see them you see it on your website oh we also do voice when in actual sense there's no voice, so then they put voice there because they have the reach, they have the ability to talk to the donors, they're able to get all this deal and they come to you, hey, either let me buy you out or let me use your technology. So then people use the, the, you know, the collaboration phrase to steal ideas from people because most of these organizations are for profit, they have uh, in, in investors on the table, investors want them to be able to make their return. So if there's a new player in the field, you have to crush them and make the maximum profit. So it's really, really fierce out there. So if you see most of these uh, mobile for development projects, they are, their technologies are not open. They, you can create an account, you see part of it, but the rest is hidden until you become a paying customer. So it's really, really, really competitive. And then there's also a lot of uh, uh, money involved. So then people are really, really um, um, fierce and uh, 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 I, don't know, I don't know how to put it, but they are really, really serious when it comes to that. If you, if you stand in their way, uh, it could be really dangerous. Um, the second one is about uh, if we want to take it all, all on. Yep. Um, what we want to do at this point is um, support small scale farmers to make more money for themselves and also see how we can be able to be making some money on the side through helping the food companies as far as technology is concerned. Um, we are still learning. Um, today or yesterday I was talking with the traceability team of one of the big, big food companies and I realized that it's much more complex than I thought. But for now, we just want to be able to provide technology that they can use for communication, data collection, and uh, um, traceability, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on the value chain, let me quickly add something small. Um, one other issue is also about uh, packaging and also service lost. Um, of course, we've not done a lot much there as a country. And even the, um, the I mean, the warehouses that we have, we've not really put them into practice or use them fully. So what we do is actually also provide them with the content and also help them to assess local markets. So the farmer doesn't have to go through the packaging process or the storage process. As soon as he produces everything, then there's already market, which is locally he can assess. He knows the price. And so that also helps a lot. Yeah. Please. Yeah, I had a couple of questions as well. Um, you had uh, those numbers about impact on the screen. Yeah. But um, I was wondering, did you have any work to um, sort of looking at the farmers specifically in terms of their age or location or gender? Like, who are the people you are working with and whether they are very representative or not about the general population of farmers in these three countries? Um, okay, so we are very grounded in Ghana. Uh, for the other two countries, we just started last week, so we've not had it. Okay, okay. So we don't know a lot there. Um, for for Ghana, uh, 4,000 of the 5,000 people are actually women, serving so farmers. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry. And then we got that because of a project that is going on in Upper West, uh, an organization called MEDA, M E D A dot org. Um, they, their focus is to help women farmers as much as possible. So then, right now in Ghana, they are supporting about 4,000 women farmers that are growing serving. So, so then they hired us to do the content, uh, to do communication 
and also to push content that we have co-created together to their farmers. So that's basically what, what, they are do, what we are doing. What we've seen with the women is that they are more likely to apply what they've learned on the mobile phone and they listen more. So then if we send them about two minute message, they stay about 80%, 80 to 100% of the time. Whilst the men are between 60 to 70%. Uh, why they do that, we, ha we have no idea. Uh, um, uh, the impact, how we got that number was, uh, just like how I met Nick in Ghana, I met a PhD candidate when I was in Canada, I think in 2012. And then, we, and then we kept in touch for like a year later and he said, he said and he told me that he's doing his thesis on poverty, small scale farmers, and he asked if we'll be able to give him the chance to come and join us in Ghana, work with us to help us uh, to set up uh, um, frameworks internally that we'll, that we'll be using to measure this impact. So he came to Ghana, he spent four months with us, and he, he helped us to, uh, um, to come up with this figure. But as to we investing into learning a lot about the farmers, we've not done that yet because is very expensive and because most of the time we are working with uh, third party organizations who already have their own frameworks in place and then they have their own targets they have, they have their own um, um, indicators so we just provide them with the technology that they will need to collect data and then also to communicate yeah. yeah and my other question would have been exactly about the three countries and whether you have noticed any differences between them in terms of any sorts of regulations or institutions but it's just starting so yeah yeah we, we'll we have, find yeah, out. yeah. yeah. We don't know a lot in Sierra Leone and Cameroon. Mm -hmm. Mark was first. No, go, go for it. Oh, uh, mine's a comment, really. Um, just thinking uh, out loud, it's not a question, but I was just thinking, what's, uh, so radio communication, what's the benefit of using mobile technology at the moment above the radio? Because you could get all the messages you need just through listening to a radio program. But I think as soon as you can phone up and ask a question, then it becomes much more interactive. Yeah, yeah. So you, you've not got the short code set up. Yeah. Mm. You actually, I think the two of them have to move together. The, the radio has been the oldest form of communication. My aunt has a wooden, wooden radio, and that's what she was using when I was very young with her to receive information on politics and all that. Uh, one, the reason why they need to move together is that um, it's not always that you can be able to get information from the radio, so then you have to be able to know when the program comes. And at times when the program is on agriculture and then they are giving the information, maybe you are busy on the farm or maybe you are busy doing something else. And at times you also need somebody to be able to remind you in a timely manner to actually take an action on the, on the farm. So then if the radio program is in the evening and then you need to be able to like feed your fish about a certain quantity in the morning that you already missed it. So then the two of them have to go hand in hand. So, then, so let's say if you use a radio to do a program, maybe a workshop, People listen to it, then you can use a mobile phone as a reminder to send to people uh, to help them to take actions on the phone. So I think I think they told them how to move uh, hand in hand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But for those who are also um, project managers, um, you're only able to also determine the listening rates with the radio. Yeah. But with our platform, you're able to know who listened to a particular message and then um, the listening rate. And also the, it, you're able to send a message again within a particular time interval. So if um, you miss the message, let's say 20 minutes ago, in the next 20 minutes, mm. the message will also be repeated. So the person picks the call. Mm. Yeah. So you're able to track. Um, but the, the radio data. is still an incredibly effective tool, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It Admitted is. That, considering that. how much, how low the cost. Yeah. 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 And also, I mean, the radio so is to demonstrate your, your effectiveness against such a slow technology yeah. thing. Yeah. Sorry, so you have to take sorry, it sorry, much further. So you have to sorry, come again, please. I didn't get the last point. So you almost have to prove your that your technology is that much more effective than such a simple. Because what you're saying isn't to me isn't that much better. Just knowing that a farmer has listened to it because you can see at the market if the yeah. yields have increased. I th I, I, just a co comment. I think it, the thing that's really interesting. One of the things that's really interesting. I mean, it's amazing. Like the numbers are incredible. The, one of the things that's really interesting is being able to map each individual farmer, and like if you think about your ability to to be given a loan or a piece of microfinance to assist you to continue to farm, if you have a track record of a three-year period for that individual through a mobile device that tags it to you, all of a sudden you're generating a long-term value sort of asset that you can that you can measure in a way that third parties will will believe. Exactly. Um, I think that it's really, I think for me, that's, and if you're going back to the principle, if it's a value of, 
empowering the individual yeah. um, and giving choice to individuals who maybe don't always have choice. That's a, a really differential kind is of it, That's almost piece. like evaluation for a mobile phone, isn't it? Over time, essentially. Yeah. Essentially, you're, you're track, I assume you're tracking the individual against their plot, so against their mobile the device, and that's their number that you generate. Yeah. And, yeah. Do, you, do you collaborate with any radio programs? Do you try to match whatever the radio program says you to complement that, or is that separate? Are you aware of what's on the radio? Uh, I, let, me, let me be honest, I don't listen to the radio that much, because there's a lot of policies in Ghana. But, so, some of the projects that we worked in, like the first USAID pro project, they've had some radio stations in the northern region that they're working with. So at times we get the content, uh, recorded uh, sessions of the radio, and then we're able to slice it into pieces and then we send it out oh, yeah, to okay. the farmers. But we working with the radio stations directly, no. The, the only way that we work with them is to actually get use their equipment to do our recording. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes. Yeah, so then they have like their own studio and everything. So if you want to be able to record the messages in the various local languages, we use their translators and also the equipment to do it so that we don't have to set it up by ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you advertise your services on the radio though? No, no not yet. Not oh, yeah. yet. Because they, they have to be able to get a way to be able to subscribe directly. So then if we get a short code, then we can run an advertisement and then tell them to text something to a short code and, you know, to get onto the platform. Yeah. Cool. And also, like, you know, the questions that you, you asked and then the point that you raised uh, just uh, uh, occurred to me that we need to be able to collaborate with the academia a lot. Um, like when we're trying to deploy in Sierra Leone, the people have money, they, they know what they want to measure, but they have no idea how to create questionnaires, like, the, the, like you know, the kind of questions that they have to be able to ask to, to, you know, to measure the impacts or the, you know, the indicators that they were looking for. And then they were willing to pay for it and I have no idea how to do that. And then you know, nobody in my team knows how to do that. And I realized that during the course of our work, we had a lot of people like you know, um, research people like Nick coming to us asking us a lot of questions, and there are a lot of experts on that. On that, so and even in the content generation, right? There are a lot of people who are doing so much research that we can be able to learn from. There's um, a project at MIT that I'm aware of called Unleashing the Wealth of Nations, and they're looking sorry. for. I'll, I'll give you the details. Okay. But essentially, they they're looking to measure um, value in the economy where the, it's not currently being measured. So it's essentially like how do you revalue the productivity of a country. Okay. It's, it's like a massive wow. visionary kind of project, but it's, I think, sponsored through S the SWIFT, which is the money transfer agency. Okay. And I know the research doing it, and they've got some funding in certain countries. So people are really looking for data points okay. that, that aren't currently measured electronically, so therefore they don't exist. Yeah. Do you know what I mean, to yeah. most people? Yeah. Yeah. He's working with a lot of banks, too. Uh, yeah, thanks. Well, thanks for sharing what you what you do with us. I have a question about, um, well, maybe just a prompt. If you could tell us a bit more about the precision and the accuracy of some of the information. So, if you could, when does it go wrong? You know, when is when is bad information being transmitted? Yeah. Because surely it happens sometimes. Mm. Or maybe bad information is the the wrong phrase there, but uh, imprecise information or less less accurate than you would wish it to mm. be information? So, um, it usually happens during the translation. So they have content on rice, maize, soybean, and they are trying to translate it in local languages. The guy doing the translation, and at times in languages that we ourselves don't fully understand, so that becomes tricky. So then the person uses a phrase that could mean something else in that language. We've had a, um, a, a situation whereby we had there's a language in Upper West, Upper, upper um, West called Sisala. Uh, Sisala, Trumu, and, and Pina. Yeah. yeah. So then we got there, they have the same name, they're actually different. So they went to a community to do a workshop, we played the audio file to them, hey, and then they understood, they went to another community, and it actually mean totally different. It means to, mean something totally different. So to, so then we get, we get the, how do you call it, we get some of the information lost during translation. So then, Actually, getting people in house who actually speak those languages to verify yeah. will be the next step. But at, at this stage, we can't afford that. Um, and also, the next one is the weather forecast. Being able to say for sure that it is going to rain is really risky, so we don't do that. We we have about twenty-five phrases that describes and gives ranges of when it will rain. So slightly likely that it will rain. It will not rain. There's no chance it to rain. Like being able to give that information and give like a range so that at least when it happens, you fall within that range. 
we are able to give like we, are, we, we can't tell you that it will rain today so that go and take this action but then we'll give you a, a range <coughs> of uh, various uh, possibilities so that's what we do with the weather forecast and then for the weather forecast we use the their um, gps coordinates so then uh the tropics the weather varies a lot so then you can rain right in this corner and then the, and, and then the next corner is, is uh, you know the sun is really high so then we pick the gps coordinates of each farm and then we are able to uh, work with a company in the u.s called aware so this they generate weather data using um satellite information so then we are able to send these gps coordinates to them and then they give us a forecast and then if it falls within the 25 phrases then we pick it construct a, a sentence and then we send it in the language that the farmer understands so that's why we how we deal with the weather forecast but with the hard other content that, that that loses its meaning through translation we've not been able to tackle that yet so what about with the, with the other content the mm -hmm. non-weather content so you know it loses some some meaning I mean, yeah. it yeah. sounds like uh, well, some meaning or sometimes lots of meaning yeah. with translation but what about the the thing that's being translated is that sometimes just wrong itself like I, I know nothing about yeah, feeding fish so. but the, you know what are there different levels of acidity in different lakes or rivers and some fish need different you see what I'm saying yeah yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah um, what actually we do trying to minimize the loss of um, information the content we work with our lecturers a lot at the university and so um, for fish content we do it with the lecturer at the fisheries department mm -hmm. and then also the government agency the fisheries commission so Having gotten the content from this place, we also send it to this place for review. And even um, the project partners that we are working with, they also have in-house agronomists. So they also go through. So it passed through at least three major stages before the content can go out for a professional to record it. Mm -hmm. So normally, like my CEO said, if there's a loss of content, it's just through translation. But even when it's I mean, recorded, we also make sure other um, aspects on the particular project listen to the content. Yeah. In, 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 in the future, in the future, the ideal thing will be for somebody growing rice or maize, giving them information based on their their soil type, yeah. their acidity in the soil. Yeah. So with that, you, you can go wrong if you, you're unable to measure all those data well. Exactly. And now we are not collecting that, and the information we try to be as general as possible, so that it can be applied, or you can use that information and with your own experience on the farm, then you can be able to like apply that. Yeah. Like you know, cases like um, fish farming, you need to be able to know the oxygen uh, in the water, you need to be able to measure so many things in the water, which we don't really, really measure. So we don't go into that detail, like giving a general, like, you know, giving information using those parameters. We try to give a general advice as possible so that everybody else will be covered. But giving the details, we don't try it right now because we are unable to, like, collect any information um, from, from, from the farmers to be able to give that kind of information. But would that, would that be maybe a strategy for the future to, to kind of collect that? The, from the farmers and then tailor more contextual yeah yeah to yeah for for the fish farmers uh last last year i was in a conference in the u.s and then I, I met a guy who invented from india who invented a technology that can be able to measure the acidity level the oxygen level uh, of, of, a, of a fish pond and that information will be sent through gsm so data or sms back to a server in the cloud and, and then you're able to like advise farmers based on that mm -hmm. but it's just really expensive and uh we can't sell it to farmers in ghana yet he has offered to give us some samples to try out but we've not done anything on that but i i see a clear future in that um if we can be able to get like really really cheap tools to be able to measure that mm -hmm. yeah. another one um you mentioned that the sort of model of sending of the farmers going to these um coming together to have these meetings and and actually it's a place where they like to get together and see each other and talk yeah, to yeah. one another. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I get the feeling that the, the, the project that you've got is very much about delivering to individuals, but mm -hmm. could you conceptualize that this project could also provide some sort of service that collectivizes those farmers as well around, I, I don't know, whatever, perhaps they've got common interests that they want to know about politics of the, yeah, yeah, or yeah. could you conceptualize that it could be, it, you could innovate the technology? Technology wise it's possible. Once we're able to get our license, it's possible. Within our company right now, we have a, a corporate line from the mobile networks, whereby when I call him, if my number is free to me, so then we charge for free, mm -hmm. but we are paying for everybody a, a fixed amount of uh, airtime every year sorry every month for each uh, team member so that, as you know we are all working for formal line you all have a, a, a sim card that formal line makes sure you get 
about x amount of data and also x x amount of call time that same principle can be, can be given to farmers because when they pay for us maybe you're paying like one ghana cd which is very very small a month for for our services then you can be able to talk to each other so right now there's you know the technology is there to make that happen yeah. so then you when i call you i can call you for free but i can only call for free if i remember a member if i remember if i remain a member of farmer line and then i'm paying my monthly fee to keep receiving information so that is there and it's really really possible yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it would be very great. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just to keep that connection going between the farmers as well with yeah, information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because there, there's a lot that they can share. Yeah. And even at a conference, there are some of the fishermen that are really, really doing well. They even export some of their fishes to Nigeria. They even get students from Nigeria to come to their farms to learn from them. And some of them are still doing poorly. So then it's also a time for them to like learn from each other, to share ideas, uh, which they don't get uh, at all in the year. So. Um, Adding that in the future will be really useful. A typical example could be a farmer has um, an order of, say, I need a fish, and he doesn't have the quantity to, I mean, so he can quickly call other colleagues who is nearby and then bring quantity and then he markets for that particular farmer. So I think it's going to be great um, technology that will help them to increase their income. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't want to slow down the, the, the brainstorming, the ideas, but to me it seems that the business model and the partnership model is already quite elaborate and complex. There's so many different entities that you're interacting with, and these entities themselves are quite complex and difficult to, to manage. So is that not an issue, and now you want to add new technologies and new ideas and work with academia? When is that, when is that getting too much? How do you maintain focus on what, what matters, and how do you create value? Trying to pull together so many different entities and yeah. you know value chains and information pieces, technology. How how do you do that? How do you maintain focus on of, of of what you need to do and what the right strategy is? I think it's about making what we have right now better, and that's why we are interacting with all these people. Because if you are sending information to farmers or you are designing questionnaires to measure impact that is giving you the wrong indicators, you should be able to work with people who help you to make that better. And that's what we are doing, like trying to go out, going after the problem and keeping focus on it by trying to like bring in as many people as possible without help us to refine us to be really, really good at what we do. We, we, became, in, we became really interested in the food companies because the biggest problem in Ghana, aside uh, farmers getting access to finance, is being able to sell what they're producing. And also somehow being able to um, store it and sell in the future or making the most money from what they're producing. And that's what caused us to start thinking about how do like you know good uh, like you know goods produced from Ghana actually move around the country, and how do they actually move out of the country? And that's where we got to understand what these big companies like Unilever and Amajaro are doing, and then their interest in in working with small scale farmers. And then we think about what will hook them or what will make them. Uh, how do we get them involved? It's, it's about about make using what we have right now and giving it to them to make some part of their life better, either through making them more efficient or, or saving them money so that we can bring them in, into the picture. And, and that's what we are doing at this point. So I think we, you know, we like to see it as uh, we trying to make our processes better as much as we can. Can I have a similar question? Like there's information, all this information, you know, how do you like refine, you talked about the fish example, you've got all these systems, you're improving systems, Ghana's a big place. You know, you guys are clearly like trying to optimize and get this, everything up and running and working well. Have you saturated the Ghana market? I imagine maybe, maybe not yet. Um, and if you haven't, you know, is there a reason why you're expanding into other countries while you're still going through this refinement process? Because there's a lot, you know, there's a lot going on for you guys. So I'm just curious at what the strategies are behind that. Well, well we are selling different parts of this, right, of this yeah. uh, technology. So. Yeah. Being in uh, in Sierra Leone and, and Cameroon doesn't actually affect the kind of content that we develop, that we give to small scale farmers in Ghana. Do you still need to understand that particular area of Sierra Leone and that particular type of farming and talk to the agricultural agencies and find new university contacts? Do you no, know the, the system? Oh, you don't? No, we don't. Okay. So then Amajaro yeah, has boots on the ground that is working, get, they, are, they are working, working with farmers. So then yeah. We just create an account, like how you have Facebook, yeah. uh, you create an account and deploy the technology for yourself. So then you collect your own data. We don't do anything. The technology is already in the cloud. <coughs> Everything that we, any improvement or new code that we write to improve our efficiency on the ground goes to anybody else that has, that has created an account on the ground. Cool. So then we don't need to make any partnership on the ground. We don't need to be able to create any content. 
because they are just like using our technology and then in some cases they they, they change the, the brand and then the colors to match their own brand so then they are just paying us every year for a fee, a fee for using the technology we don't we don't take any credit or any liability for the content that they deliver to their farmers perfect. yeah perfect thank you so that's also the future of any expansion in other countries is going to be through some licensing model yeah, or something like that. Yeah. You, you not expanding yourself as yeah. farmer line. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Aren't you missing out on an opportunity? <laughs> Sorry? Aren't you missing out on an opportunity to run it yourself? To run your own organization by well, going to another country? Well, working with, this country, working with these organizations, as we've, as we've seen in, in Ghana through these eight organizations, help us to identify the opportunities. Most of these aid organizations and businesses have a singular focus and then they go after that. And then they have a lot of resources on the ground that we can use and make as much revenue as possible. So let's take um, in Ghana, the first, the first year we got, um, the first year this CID project paid for our market information system, which we built and then we are selling to other people right now. The second one actually develop, helped us to develop content for rice, maize, soya bean. They have, their, they have their own agronomies in-house. So now we, we worked with them to format all those content that they have paid for. And then because they've gotten their results, which is something that they want, they, they are gone. And then that same content is being sold to other NGOs and businesses in Ghana. So then right now, last year we added cocoa because somebody wants to pay for cocoa. And then there are other people who are also working in cocoa who will pay for it. So we've seen, we, we are seeing this. Uh, big uh, NGOs and businesses as a way for us to understand markets and for us to identify the opportunity there if we have to like set up local office there because they pay for the initial deployment and anything that they need to do and then all the data comes back to us. Do you, who owns the data? Mm -hmm. uh, some of them want to owe it uh, like the food companies want the, wants the data to be very very exclusive so um, uh, Hamajaro that buys cocoa and sells cocoa owns every data. We can't see where the farmers are, we, we can't see it. But the NGOs don't really care about data because usually they are funded by uh, um, taxpayers' dollars. They want to; they just want to be able to report the impact of their radically, their interventions. They want to be able to get a figure. So then the data becomes public, and then we are free. And even some of them even see it as a way for for them to support us. So you kind of co-own, or no one owns it. It's public Sorry? good. Well, well, it, it becomes well. It's technically a public sold, good. Would you sold the data? Sorry. Would they mind if you sold the data? No, they don't mind. Okay. Yeah, they don't mind. So when you give the farmers the package, do they sign a contract at all? When you give them a SIM card or is there a contract that says that you have that, that data is yours to use and sell on? I'm just wondering because this is the kind of key, I guess, what's happening yeah, with yeah. this profiling information is really important exactly. for your business model, I would imagine. Mm. Well, well, we don't give SIM cards to the farmers. Okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but right now, every liability or anything that happens goes to the the NGOs or the food companies that we are that we are working with because the agreement is just between us. So, they say, farmer line, I want to use your platform for communication for data collection. We help them set up the deploy, they pay us their, our money, whatever they they go and collect, whatever data that they collect, and whatever they, whatever they use it for, is up to them. If if there is any bomb, they you know they take it or all by themselves but we just ride on it to learn as much as we can to see what else is missing and how can we use that data to be able to create services that will generate us money as a company yeah because you might there might be a point when your access to multiple data points across a, like a large series of populations could uh, you, part of your service could be the data yeah. you know providing the data to people Eventually. analyzing the data and who owns it might then become a really important question in terms of the value of your business or how you're developing your business. Um, so, so who owns the data in the long run? Yeah, you know, what it's makes your value, service... Right? Uh, because yeah. you're profiling these farmers yeah. and you have an individual atomized piece of information and if you're actually, like Mark was saying, if you're, you've got a, um, a piece of technology that can actually collect environmental information as well that that is connected to that geographical place mm. that's really valuable that wow. atomized profiled information linked to a geographical point is really valuable what, what I've seen in other businesses is that they they make the people own the data for like maybe two years and then the agreement that they have with them is that maybe from two years onwards, and the data becomes public, or they can also have access to it. Then that, that, that was that will be built into the initial 
uh, agreement that will be signed. So maybe if you have information on on uh, socioeconomic uh, impact, you have information on the on on the environment and all these things, you can be able to decide which part of that data that you want to make open um, to us or maybe to the general public. That's something that we could explore. We, we don't have that going on right now. But I've seen it in some other businesses that are not related to farming. Or even like, I mean, this is probably not something you want to do, but let's say there's a product that you could provide that you would sell mm -hmm. to smallholder farmers. Mm -hmm. Let's say everyone wants to buy this this fish testing water, oxygen, whatever product. Mm -hmm. Could you could you use your existing network to add on additional products that are part of your business? Are you allowed to, to use that? You know, who owns that information? Who's, you know, authorized for you? Like, over time, these questions become more and more important, depending mm -hmm. on how you're structuring your business. So. Well, thanks. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. Really useful. So you, um, you basically react towards to what the market wants. So somebody wants something, and then you build it, and then you can use that elsewhere. Yeah. So what if you wanted to build something that you saw was a potential idea, but you had to self-fund it? Would you just not, would you just leave it? Or would you go after an investor, or, or have you just not sort of done that? You've just reacted to what other people need? Put you in for grants at the beginning for yeah. things. So, you, so that was quite a long time, well not a long time ago, but that was at the beginning. You, you, you said, right, we'll develop this good idea. And it was a brilliant idea. But now, since then, you've just been reacting. So what happens when you've got the next idea? Will you, or are you just making enough money now? No, we are, we are not making enough money. <laughs> 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 we're under pain, under pain of people. Um, one thing that we, I'll say that we didn't react to was the data collection, what we have on the Android right now. Yeah. It's, it's something that we talked about and we started working on before the client came. We were just trying to uh, complement we have the voice survey tool that we deployed for UNICEF in Ghana, and then we were really, really against people doing surveys through smartphones. And then we realized that our system was actually, uh, you know, the quality and the amount of data that I can collect using voice is, is actually limited. We, I remember like arguing in a conference like this, UNICEF, why they, they don't need Android phones. But, but then we got to the field and we realized that they actually need it. So then we started building something like that for people who want to do more complex surveys before um, Hamajaro came in. Um, the cost to us for, for building is somehow really small because we're able to recruit people from the university to come in and then they're happy to join us and then we're all coded. So we work all night on the, and then we live on the revenues that we are generating from the big checks from all these NGOs. So we were to create something that will sell. So then when we deployed from Ajaro the first time, they paid um, something which is really, really small because we didn't, we didn't fully understand the value that we're giving them. And then we're very lucky that we signed a deal for Jersey operation in Ghana. So then when they came back again saying that they want it in Sierra Leone and Cameroon, then we were giving them our time standing of what they were paying in Ghana, which they were still very happy in a way. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's one typical example. But until, until then, uh, when it comes to the content services, it's just if you are running a project that right now we met somebody here who wants to do something on oil palm, so then we will work with the person to be able to develop that for oil palm for them. And then once we work with them, then we get to understand how many people are actually in the field of oil palm that will, be need, that, that will need access to the same information that we are giving out to these farmers? So how many farmers are actually growing oil palm that needs help? And how many people will be willing to pay for that? So then we get to understand it and then we uh, reach out to them also. Yeah, I just had a more general question actually about um, kind of uh, government involvement in kind of farmers and farmer extension because in many countries that's been kind of a way which particularly for smallholder farmers has been very mm -hmm. beneficial. So I just wondered in, in Ghana what the status is of kind of farmer extension and then how willing are they to kind of integrate some of these kind of high tech kind of mobile tools into kind of the, the government systems or is that just something which is kind of, you know, the private firms are just kind of more dominant in Ghana? I just wondered what, what the perspective was at the moment. Well, well, well they are willing, they are willing to do that. Um, Actually, we have the Ministry of Food and Agriculture, and then they, they, their task is to um, train these farmers, give them all the information that they need. Uh, they are they're unable to do that very, very well now um, for so many reasons. It could be political and so many other reasons. Um, what, what, what has happened is that uh, they usually get either USAID or GIS or somebody else with money who that wants to be able to, uh, you know, with money with their own good agenda, maybe they have their own indicators that they want to manage. 
uh, to, to measure then they fund the government to build a tool that will help them to collect that data over a period of time and usually it shuts down over 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 uh, you know when the you know when the uh, this and the funding is finished uh, because um, it's usually funded by somebody from outside if uh, and and because the government is only supporting in kind in terms of like you know providing the infrastructure and then the people to actually use it, to use it they most of the time they are not willing to keep on providing the money to sustain such projects mm -hmm. so like in the past what is going on right now we have the World Bank and GIZ funding um, uh, a system that will help the, the extension officers to be able to communicate with the farmers on a daily basis but that has not taken uh, you know that has not taken off uh, very very strongly uh, because even though they have the system in place the extension officers are still not being paid very very well so then they are not motivated to use these mm -hmm. technologies to work so then we are seeing most of them actually leaving their works and in you know, taking jobs at uh, with the ngos instead yeah and um our root networks too is also another issue so um, essentially officers are not able to i mean travel to the villages to train the farmers and so uh, what we actually do is to involve them through our work, letting them understand that what Farmerland does has not come to display them, but it has also come to help them to do their work very well. And through that, it also helps us in a way, in, even in organizing the farmers and training them. Um, another thing also um, will also be issue about um, transport, you know, money to, even, or even allowance for them to even go to the field. And so, um, this technology with that kind of relationship we able to also help them through that. Of course, um, the Moputu declaration, the, the start declaration agreement that they made that they will commit 10% uh, of their uh, GDP into agriculture has not been made. So still there's issue about um, enough um, funds to support agriculture in Africa and especially Ghana. Yeah. But, but seriously, we need help, like honestly, like there are, there are some challenges that we don't that, that we don't even know that we'll be facing and then one thing that we do best is also, always always downplaying challenges until the heat are so hard and we sit up we sit up and <laughs> trying to and everyone does that yeah so then we just <laughs> pretend like oh it's, it's no big deal we'll, we'll survive and then so then if there are any because at, at times I, it could be really tempting if like somebody comes prefer, like to present a picture perfect like how this guy's making us look it's all, it's, it's all true anyway uh if he's already comes to pre present a company and it's looking like everything is all covered it's really hard for people to give feedback or advice because i know all of you are here are really really experienced you've done so many things uh, in the past so then if there's anything that you feel that we should be looking at and i really appreciate the uh the, 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 yeah you know the issue of data because we see the opportunity there but we just not sat down right now to think about it there's also like yeah. an interesting thing where um companies that are setting up to provide certain services that have created a really strong platform for people to pay with their mobile phone. Yeah. They're creating a very large pool of people who use their mobile phone to pay for things. Yeah. And so some of those are being v factored into valuations of companies that weren't even created to have that as a part of their core business model. Uh -huh. Because there's this opportunity to, to interact with different consumers, basically. Um, whether it's like realized as a value in the business over time, you don't know, but it's it was interesting. I actually was asking someone this about this the other day, and they said, "Yeah, it was factored into their valuation." I see. Yeah, and yeah. they were a pretty pretty young company too. I see. You sound like an investor. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> actually, I was, actually, actually, I'm working with an investor, but but uh, it, it's called CDC Group, but they do much um, like very large kind of equity investments. But yeah. Difford's now got a new strategy for yeah. private sector investing for SMEs. They're launching. It's definitely worth talking to them. Wow, cool. If you, only, if you know anybody there, yeah. I'll find out for you. Yeah, sure. Actually, you know, there's someone here from Grameen Foundation in Ghana. Oh, really? Who funds the, the, the our yeah. here at the moment. Wow. Yeah, you're following each other. Yeah, I heard. I heard they the do grant based funding for stuff like Grameen. Oh, okay. Yeah. I see. I'll introduce like, you guys. Sure, please. Free, you can meet in Ghana, though. Sorry? <laughs> you can meet when you're back in Ghana. Yeah, we're happy to. Yeah. Happy to. I'm going to ask a non-MBA, a non-business <laughs> business question. Sorry. Uh, no, it's good. That's what, that's what he's here for. Usually, then, you know, us social scientists can't really add much to the business model and give advice on that. Um, but quite the opposite. How can we create competition for you guys? How could there be more farmer lines? I know it's a very sort of broad and open question, but, you know, donors, development organizations, but also general discourse says, like, 
you know, create a mobile application, there's this uh, information transfer value created on all sides, everyone is happy. Yeah. But obviously that's not happening, you know, or it's happening very, very rarely, and you're yeah. sort of one of these exceptional cases. Why, why is that not happening more? Why is it, you know, I'm sure there's hundreds, if not thousands, of great ideas that could be, uh, uh, you know, could turn out f to be pharma lines if there was execution or if c certain ingredients were there. Yeah. So what is missing for all these ideas that, to, to be there? What was there for you? That, 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 that helped and what is missing for the others? Mm. I know it's a broad question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Sorry. Yeah, you know it's I wouldn't ask it in an interview. Mm. But. <laughs> mm. What kinds of things had to come together for you for, for this to work? I mean, I guess you've, you've given us some, some impressions of how complicated this is, actually. Mm. Um, you know, what do you think was, was, you know, was the spark for you to, for it to, to happen and, and, and that, that is missing for others? I think it's basically the team, right? Um, the team, the team finding the the right team, the pe people who are committed and willing. I, I think that's all we got. Because you know, we also we didn't know a lot. So then, if you get somebody who is willing to wake up every morning and then only think about your idea, that's what's enough. Um, they 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 didn't have to be a qualified MBA person. And then we all figure it out together. We. We go out and make mistakes during investor pitches. Go, go out and make mistakes with clients. And last year we lost our forty thousand dollars because I overpriced, yeah. which is <laughs> I overpriced, and then I took the blame for it. Uh, and I still hate hate it up to now. So like like we we just go out and do what what we have to do, um, and also like you know take advantage of the opportunity that is there. Cause you know when I started doing this, like going for competitions, so many other Ghana people can criticize a lot. We have a lot of people who can talk. So people are just saying, Pamela is just winning awards, nothing is happening on the ground. I, I just didn't care because I knew what we were doing. We've not had any investor like money right now. We still own the company 100%. We raised over $10,000 through awards. If we were to listen to all those who are saying, you're just winning awards, blah, 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 we would have taken somebody very, very earlier on without even knowing where we are going with the company ourselves. And then, you know, I don't know where we'll be right now. Maybe we'll be another is Isoko. Um, I have no idea. Um, but I think I think that you should take advantage of the opportunity because we saw that there was a lot of conversation about supporting entrepreneurs. When Obama came to power, he was talking about he came to Ghana. He said that he believed that the youth can be able to um, take advantage of the opportunities that are there and create change from the bottom up. So he started creating all these competitions, and then we grabbed it. We went after them. You realize that certain donors or certain um, funders are, or NGOs are looking for certain types of entrepreneurs. They want to be able to share some stories. Maybe they want to say, hey, I have, maybe in their report they say, oh, I took, I actually created a job by taking an African entrepreneur, by giving them part of my grant. When we know that we play so well, in during our presentation, we are, we are not afraid, some of them, we will say, hey, we are an African company. If you give it to this big company, they are already big, you know, but believe in young companies and then you get to write good reports. I, I believe in 11 people and then they are, and then they are getting <laughs> salaries now, we, we, we work it out. Somebody wants uh, an addition of uh, an African person on their panel to share their story. I'm happy to go. I know that yeah, you know, some of them might be exploitation, but I just don't care. Like last year, there was uh, in the Mobile World Congress. It was very big. They invited high-profile people, and they paid for their flight. When it came to me, they said, "Oh, we don't have money for flight. We only have 700 euros." I said, "No, no, no big deal." I went online, booked Airbnb with an Israeli friend. That's not a very good friend. I flew down to uh, Spain for the first time in my life with just about 100 euros in my pocket. I stayed with this guy, and then I saw another Ghanaian at the airport. I, I said, oh, you know, come and stay with me. We went to this guy's house. He was pissed, but he was really, you know, gentle about it. We sat on that panel, like, you know, really, really intensive. But from that conference, getting that exposure, we got so many people who were interested in either writing a piece about us on, in the, on the Guardian or writing a piece about us in the article. For their own reasons, but somehow we are just able. We are just we are just very good at finding opportunities, whether they are trying to exploit us or not, or not, and turning that energy into something really positive that works for us. And we just maintain that focus. Um, so yeah, right now when I came here, of course there was a lot of uh, 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 you know you shared a lot of article. You wrote something really good about me on the Oxford website. I shared it on Facebook. You know some good comments, some really like you know negative comments. But we know why we are here, so that's all that matters. Um, so finding the opportunities that lie around you and turning it into something really positive that works for you, I think. Yeah. That's something I'll share with people. And I also think that um, sometimes 
incubation centers also really helped. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. at university, uh, there was an incubation center yeah. which we started working from that place. You know, there was free internet access. So, yeah. you know, we and would Friday. spend the nights sometimes there and it was really, really helpful. For like eight months, we didn't pay, we yeah. didn't pay rent. Mm -hmm. So it could have been very internet. difficult for us yeah. if mm -hmm. we were to get a... And so we decided to leave ourselves because we, we were making in, enough that could be able to uh, rent a place to stay. So that was also really, really, and then the incubation center also helped us to recruit people. Yeah. So the people come and they, they always see us like working, working so hard. So then you know they want to be part of that. So then they're happy to either join, join us for hackathons to hack something that we we'll, we'll then go and sell for maybe maybe two thousand dollars or three thousand dollars for. So that so that actually helped using the like the small small resources that we have in our in our environment to um, to get what we want. Yeah. Approaching six o'clock. Good. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.